Um, yeah, so I'm delighted to uh, introduce our guest for the special seminar today, Professor Tuna Jesperson from Aarhus University. Um, like so many people in diffusion microstructure, he comes from a rather theoretical background. <laughs> um, so Tuna did uh, a PhD in theoretical physics in Aarhus. He did a postdoc in more theoretical physics in Vancouver and is now back um, in Aarhus as a, a full professor. And he's currently uh, wrapping up a one year sabbatical at NYU. Um, actually, I'm wrapping up right now, so it's nice that you could make it come here while you have to get rid of all your stuff with <laughs> Um And uh, Suna is going to talk about new probes of tissue microstructure, double diffusion encoding metrics, and their time dependence. Thank you very much, Thomas. And thank you for inviting me. Yes, so um, I apologize in advance for might be a bit um, a lot of equations for some people's tastes, but uh, I, I can't do it in any other way. And you just feel free to interrupt me and ask what it means. And uh, I, I, I hope to to convey the meaning um, regardless of what I'm talking about. So the basic sequence that uh, that I'm interested in is this uh, double diffusion encoding sequence. And just as the uh, name implies, it's simply just two back-to-back -back spin echo versions of a, a standard state school tenor diffusion encoding pulse. So the idea is that you have a lot of extra degrees of freedom with which you can probe the uh, tissue microstructure. So you have the normal pulse widths and diffusion time, uh, but you have one, a pair of each, you know, one for each of the diffusion encoding blocks. And you also have a mixing time that you can vary. I'm usually just going to think about this in terms of, uh, of effective gradient waveforms. So just reversing the polarity of the, uh, of the gradient lobes according to the number of RF pulses. Um, and I'm also usually going to be working in the narrow pulse approximation so that I can just say that the, uh, the, the phase after having applied one of these gradients is just Q times the position during this pulse. I'll come back to that, uh, to that later on. So this, this sequence was originally proposed by Corey et al. to, uh, to measure anisotropy of yeast cells. I'll come back to that shortly. But the basic idea of the sequence, of course, is, is, is just a correlation experiment. And indeed, um, Callaghan and, and Puro have used this kind of idea to, to look at exchange between different local environments. Um, here's an example. Basically, you imagine that your signal, your, your molecules can sample, um, can be in different environments with different diffusion coefficients. And uh, your signal, therefore, is just some kind of uh, Gaussian uh, signal from each of these environments. So it's BD, B1, D1, and B2, D2. And then you just count how many uh, spins experienced a, a diffusion um, uh, coefficient d1 and a diffusion coefficient d2 in the second period. Okay, and uh, you can think of this as an inverse uh, as a Laplace transform, and you can try to sample with different p values and invert it, and you can get these kind of diagrams as we know. And by change varying the, the mixing time, you can you can say something about how long the molecules reside in the different local environments. A more recent uh, modification of this idea is the asymmetric double diffusion encoding or the FEXI sequence proposed by the Lund group. Here the idea of the first pulse is basically to act as a filter where you preferentially uh, attenuate the fast diffusing spins and then you measure, you use the second pulse to measure the effective diffusion coefficient from that and by varying the delay between the two pulses again you allow it to grow, grow back up to its full value um, to varying degrees and from that by fitting to this kind of exponential equation, you can you can estimate the exchange time between the two uh, two environments there. Before I continue, I just want to connect to this B tensor shapes that uh, you might have heard about before. Uh, it was I think it was introduced by Weston and Topgard and, and those people again from the Lund group. Um, so normally, of course, the B tensors were introduced I think by Levian many years ago, and in that case, it was mostly thought of uh, in terms of, um, of linear diffusion encoding. So normal statistical center, you have one diffusion encoding block. In that case, we know that the, the B tensor will just be proportional to the kind of the dyadic product, the Q squared basically. And in, in an appropriate frame, this means that the diffusion tensor looks like this, right? So it has just not one non-zero uh, eigenvalue. So we can represent it by a stick. That's why it's called a linear diffusion encoding. So DDE, on the other hand, is planar diffusion encoding. So now we have two uh, diffusion encoding periods, and we can actually write the 
a diffusion tensor is this. And then again, in a, an appropriate frame when Q and Q2 are perpendicular, we can uh, write the diffusion, uh, the B tensor like this. So now it has two non-zero eigenvalues and can represent it by, by a disk, just like you know, for the diffusion tensor, we could also have, have used ellipsoids instead. So generalizing this, we can write an, a general uh, diffusion uh, a B tensor as a, an, a, a mixture of spherical encoding, planar encoding, and linear encoding. I didn't mention spherical encoding, but that's obviously just three blocks, for example, that you have. And Tokwa has introduced this uh, nice diagram of how you can move from, like uh, over here you have uh, the stick encoding. Uh, so the B linear is the only non-vanishing term here. And then as you move here, you add more planarity. In this direction, we add more sphericity into your encoding and you get all of these shapes that you can use to probe this different aspects of the diffusion signal. So I'll get back to that later on, we'll use that. But just uh, for most of the time, I'll talk in terms of Q vectors though. And just to see what actually are we talking about here, uh, I've written down how I would work with this kind of signal, um, namely just as this um, product of phase factors. So we know from the first diffusion encoding pulse we encode one displacement, so R0 minus R of T1, where this is T1 this time here. And then we wait a mixing time, so time becomes T1 plus Tm. And that is encoded by the second uh, diffusion wave vector Q2. And this is the final displacement. So basically what we get, oh, okay, and here Q, R1 and R2 um, are then the two displacements of the two periods. So that is, that is our measurement. That's what we are sensitive to. So we can now see that it's a kind of correlation experiment again but with uh, of two displacements, R1 and R2. Uh, and it's kind of shown here. So we diffuse for a while. This is encoded in the first block. Then we have a mixing time in the green period. And then the last uh, diffusion encoding block encodes the last uh, part of this trajectory here. So why is, why is it useful for a microstructure? Well, it turns out that one of the, one of the main things is that it can distinguish these kind of two systems here. Now you might think that this is easy, but it's actually not so easy unless you have a really good idea of how, uh, what kind of geometry you have, all, you have there already so you can, you can model the, the very detailed dependence on B. Because both of these systems look isotropic when you, when you vary the um, diffusion direction. But in fact, if you have a double diffusion encoding uh, experiment, you can tell the difference between two, these two because only the system B will depend on the relative diffusion wave vector between the two systems here. And I'll, I'll give you some intuition for that uh, quite soon. But this, the idea of this thing is, I mean, this sensitivity, sorry, to, to a microscopic anisotropy, as we call this, so the individual domains, this could be axons, for example, are highly, uh, and uh, asymmetric, or sorry, um, anisotropic, whereas the kind of the macroscopic um, behavior of the system is isotropic. Here, both micro and macro is isotropic. So that was the basic idea of the of the Cori paper, as I told you about. It turns out, uh, if you take the signal difference, actually the log of the signal difference between an experiment with parallel wave vectors and an experiment with perpendicular wave vectors, then that, that difference will actually be quantify the, uh, the microscopic anisotropy of your system. Only if the overall system is, micro, is isotropic, and I'll come back to that also shortly. So what they found was if they model this as ellipses, so, so yeast cells as ellipses with the semi-axis A and B, what they found is that this difference is actually proportional to the difference of A squared and B squared, so the anisotropy. So they did this by, while these yeast cells are dividing, they, they found some way, I think, with radiation to basically stop this division. And this is at a stage where the cell is very elongated. So that's how they got these elongated cells. In reality, if you do this uh, modeling, what you find is that the signal depends on Q vector. So B, Q squared is B basically. Q to the force is the ketosis, ketosis term. And then this anisotropy term appears at fourth order. So it's a kind of a ketosis term. And then it depends on cosine squared to the angle between the two wave vectors. So you can actually also vary the, the, the angle between the two wave vectors instead of just subtracting it, it's possibly more stable. And then you see this cosine squared modulation. This is from a paper by Norm Shemish uh, in, in pig uh, spinal cord white matter. And I think they carved out some cortex also of the pig and the gray matter in. Uh, 
and they see these cosine squared patterns where the amplitude, therefore because of this thing, um, quantifies the anisotropy. So they actually found a larger local anisotropy in gray matter than in white matter. And that was one of the reasons why this was uh, very interesting to a lot of people. So here, theta is psi and theta are the same thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To measure the density of the anisotropic part, basically. Uh, not substitute the right attention Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think you might be able to do that with by dividing these ketosis terms, something I'll come back to later. You can actually see how much of the ketosis is coming from, from, from um, restricted diffusion, and how much is coming from variance in isotropic diffusivity, and how much is coming from anisotropic domains. So you might be able to at least say something about it from that. I'm not sure you can exactly get that, that number there. But, and another thing is also that this epsilon here that I have here, it's actually the population average. And this is the reason why I always try to, to, to uh, ask people to use the epsilon instead of the microscopic fractional anisotropy that people are, that is very popular. And it's, it depends if you like fractional anisotropy, you might also like microscopic fractional anisotropy. I don't like fractional anisotropy because it's, it's very difficult to interpret, I think. But anyway, the idea of this, um, and by the way, thank you for interrupting. Please just interrupt every time there's anything unclear if you have a common question. So a simple example, if you have, um, if you have crossing fibers, this scenario, imagine you could only measure in two directions, X and Y. Um, if you have an SDE experiment or if you have a parallel uh, double diffusion encoding experiments, this is what's gonna happen. So for the first pulse, when you deploy uh, uh, along the x-axis, you will kill all the magnetization in the fibers that are along x, obviously. So now if you apply the second one along the same axis, nothing more will happen, right? Now it's also clear that if you instead apply the second pulse along the uh, perpendicular direction, you will also kill the spins along the, uh, the uh, vertical fibers and therefore the signal would be lower for the perpendicular. And that's actually kind of the intuition behind the this, uh, this dependence. Although if you could only measure these two directions, it would look completely um, isotropic with, with SDE, so single diffusion encoding. So just a few words about the initial theory um, done by Mitra. He showed that if you look at long diffusion times compared to the sizes of your domains, what you will find is that the uh, diffusion signal will behave as, will be proportional to R squared. And R squared here is, the, is a measure of the size of the domain. So it's the radius of gyration. And therefore, you could actually imagine that you vary this angle for long diffusion time, and you would get a measure of the size. So for example, exon diameter, instead of varying Q, you could vary the angle between the two. So that was a lot interesting to a lot of people, and, and many tried this. Here's an example from Hamburg, uh, Jürgen Finsterbusch, who, uh, and his group, who, who did this in pig spinal cord, I believe, and they saw this cosine theta behavior. And from the amplitude here again, they could extract as an effective size of the axons, and they found uh, close to two micrometer, which I think is pretty reasonable uh, and much smaller than what you you sometimes see uh, reported, and but but much more accordant with histology, I believe. Uh, so that seemed interesting. In fact, you can also imagine you could use this to measure um, cur the curvature of fibers. This, this is, was just purely theoretical work. It hasn't been tried. I think it's a bit difficult because here again, you would have this issue that you would also get contributions from, for example, extracellular water. But maybe if you could do this with the metabolites, which I know is probably going to be very difficult, uh, then you can actually get a measure of how the radius of curvature and also the angle between two fibers because there will be correlations between spin moving along this leg and along this leg here. And this, this, this experiment is sensitive to correlations, so that's why you can extract this kind of thing here. Um, and in principle, use it to distinguish crossing and, and kissing fibers, for example. Sorry, but in this case, 
cost of a still independent bike where you're sleeping in the AC yeah. on both legs. Yeah. What if there were mixes? Right, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I think you could because then again in the branching you would have correlations, right? And the crossings you would not have correlations. So I think you would be able to, to tell that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. I don't know quantitatively how it would look like, and whether it would look different from from this one. But, but uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, all of this sounded pretty uh, exciting, but then we asked the question: Is this really so different from from SDE? It's, after all, if you go to low diffusion weighting for single diffusion encoding, then also you would have for long diffusion times that the signal behaves as one minus something and then times the radius of duration squared. It's the completely the same thing, right? So what is, what is actually the difference here? Um, the, the, the consequence, or, or sorry, the reason for this is that once you have something with Q squared, it's basically Gaussian diffusion. Right, so when you're in the Gaussian Gaussian regime, everything can be described by a time-dependent diffusion tensor, and you can get that from from uh, from single diffusion encoding. You might need several single diffusion encoding experiments to emulate it, but in principle, the information is there, and th this is the reason. If you do the cumulant expansion, so so you know the Cotton DKI and all that, you could do that for um, for double diffusion encoding as well. Okay, well, here you get the B squared D term for both of the both of, this, uh, of the um, diffusion encoding parts, D, first part B squared D, second part B squared D, and then you get a new term here, which is, the, which is a coupling between the two terms. This is the correlation part. So Q1, Q2, and then this, this tensor Q here is made, out, made up a symbol for it. And, and it, I'm summing over I and J, so repeated indices just means there's a sum there, but it didn't fit on the slide, so uh, on any of the slides, so it's, uh, it's implicit. So Q is actually just a combination of diffusion tensors at different times. It doesn't matter exactly what it is, it's just that it, it can actually be constructed if you know the time-dependent diffusion tensor. That's the important part. So it turns out that the, actually there, isn't, there is no new information at this point in double diffusion encoding. Even though you thought so, it's already there if you acquire several diffusion, uh, if you vary the diffusion time, you get the same information. And here's a demonstration of this. This is from a paper by um, Morozov, where they, um, a very nice paper, where they measured the, uh, the radii of glass capillaries of this size here. And they used this Mitra form, you know, Q squared two plus cosine theta to measure the sizes of these glass capillaries. And they got 3.1 micrometers. In the same paper, they actually also had um, normal uh, single diffusion encoding data which uh, I read off and just fitted a Gaussian to the other part, E1 minus Q squared R squared. And I got this agreement here and a diameter of 2.9 micrometer. And I would say that's the same, right? And before you say that this is more noisy than this, then you have to just look at the axis also. This is from one to 0.7, this is from one to zero. So you're zooming into this part of the figure here. So I think they're equally noisy or equally not noisy, the two things. So when do we have new information with double diffusion encoding? Because we think that we can see this, this microscopic and as such we, that we can't see without modeling at least uh, uh, SDE. Okay, so the basic question is, so the double diffusion encoding pulse is this product, this average of these two phase factors, right? So the question is, when is this equal to the product of the averages? That's actually the basic question because that, then that would be the product of two single diffusion encoding uh, signals. So when does that happen? Well, it, we can easily prove that it happens for Gaussian diffusion, and we can prove that it happens if, if diffusion is translationally invariant. I don't know how, when that is, you know, biologically the case. Um, and we can. It means that that, um, for example, when you look at the probability to go from A to B, it doesn't matter where A and B are. What matters is the difference between A and B. So it's the same probability here and here. So the holes, you can just move your point of view 
Um, so the other th with, uh, regime where it happens is when you have a long mixing time and a single pore. This is pretty clear because when you have a long mixing time, then eventually the displacement during the two periods become, becomes uh, independent of each other. So therefore you can, by construction, split this in a product. But when you have multiple pores, this no longer works, right? Because then you are averaging over the pores. So imagine you have this kind of, this kind of expression for a lot of pores, alpha cells, domains, um, and you can, you go to the long mixing time regime. So it, within each pore, it actually becomes independent R1 and R2. So you can split this product, but you still don't get the product back, right? Because the product of the individual SDE terms would be, have two sums over it. So you would have cross terms. So it's a difference between a coherent average and an incoherent average. So, so maybe there's something new there. And it actually turns out, whoopsie. Uh, yeah, it turns out that the new term only arises at fourth order. That's why at the second order we saw before, it was the same information, but at fourth order, we get the new information. So the first terms here again, are just the diffusion tensor term BD. The second term here, one from each period, each diffusion encoding. And this, the second term is the normal kurtosis, B, B squared or Q fourth times kurtosis tensor. And then I go to the long mixing time where this Q tensor I talked about before is zero. So we don't worry about that right now. Uh, and then we get this new term, again, a coupling Q1 squared, Q2 squared. So it's a coupling between the two um, encodings. And this is the new tensor C. So what does that set tensor mean? It turns out that uh, in, this, in this limit of long diffusion times, this tensor actually becomes the covariance tensor of diffusion tensors. It sounds complicated, but it, it's not that complicated actually. So imagine you have, we have an overall tensor, uh, diffusion tensor D, Dij. And then we have one for each cell, each pore, D, which is denoted with an alpha. We can take the average of that over all pores. Then of course we get back the net diffusion tensor, which is the overall average diffusion tensor. And in a little while, I'll also, I'll also need the individual, the eigenvalues of the individual diffusion tensors. So with this tensor, we can actually say a little bit more, with normal DTI, you can only talk, you can only characterize DIJ, so basically the average of the four tensors. But with DDE, you now gain access to the second moment. So something with heterogeneity, something with complexity, variance within the, within the voxel. So, yeah. In the C tensor, that's 21 uh, numbers. So the, the kurtosis tensor has 15, and this one has six additional that you, that you cannot probe with, uh, so that you cannot probe with SDE basically. So that's exactly the new information there. So this is not important. It's just to say that this eccentricity index that I talked about before can be constructed from the C tensor and the diffusion tensor. So that's good. And this is important it is that when you, uh, we found that when you, actually work out these details, it turns out that this eccentricity index that Corey and those use for, for yeast cells is actually just the variance of diffusion tensor eigenvalues. So this is basically the, the, the uh, numerator of the uh, fractional isotropy. Except now it's not for the overall diffusion tensor, it's for the individual, it's for the individual domains. And that's how you can see an, isot an isotropy, right? Because if the, the overall diffusion tensor can be isotropic, but if the, individ but if the, if the uh, domain ones are anisotropic, you would still get something here, right? Because you have the, uh, you have the anisotropy of the individual ones. So that's good. That's, how, that's ex exactly what it means in general, not just in the long diffusion time limit where it's this size thing or anisotropy thing of the sizes geometrically. Uh, yeah, so this was the, the formula for that and just to have some examples. So if we have like uh, axons, for example, with a parallel and the perpendicular diffusivity, this eccentricity actually becomes the difference squared of the two um, diffusivities. And they can depend on time, on time, that doesn't matter. So some of you might have heard about um, uh, this, I mentioned it earlier, Q-space, trajectory imaging and all that. And there you, can, you also get similar metrics, but in that case, it's assumed that there can be no time dependence because you have these uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, extended pulses. But here, it's a, this is general. It's just the time dependent difference uh, the, uh, between these two uh, diffusion tensors. Uh, 
So this is the covariant tensor. We can, we can use that to get epsilon, the eccentricity, but we can also use it to get the variance of isotropic diffusivity. So that just means you take the, uh, the trace within a pore, and then you look at the variance across all pores inside the voxel. You can also get that from the, from the C tensor. So it has all of this uh, information here. Uh, and you, if you want to, you can, use, you can use it to make this microscopic fractional isotropy I talked to you about before. So you just take this, um, the variance of diffusion tensor eigenvalues and divide it by a measure of its size. And that is basically just as the FA. Um, so an example, again, if you have, if you have this uh, axon or this stick from before, you get the difference between parallel and perpendicular divided by this to, to compensate for the size somehow. And this is actually the same as FA would be if you have a system of, of coherent axons. So now you see that the difference is uh, micro FA doesn't care about how you orient the, the axon. So it's insensitive to dispersion. But FA, of course, has this contribution times the dispersion of the fibers, basically, right? So it can, it can decrease if the dispersion grows. But this stays the same, ideally. And then we had this VI. And with these uh, metrics, we can distinguish these kind of systems. So we just imagine this, this could just symbolize the microscopic diffusion sensors, for example. Um, and if, with, the, with the help of these metrics, we can distinguish these systems. I mean, this one is easy. It's the only one that depends on direction. So we can just forget about that. The other ones are isotropic, uh, macroscopically. But if we look at the variance in isotropic diffusivity, this is the only one that has an unvanishing uh, mean diffusivity in the uh, variance, right? Because they are different here. They're the same here and here. So that is also distinguished. And these two can be then be distinguished by microscopic FA or, or epsilon here. So it's a way to kind of get extra information about the intravoxel behavior. So I don't want to get into this. This was just <clears throat> to say that if you, some of these uh, equations, kind of, the, the difference between parallel and perpendicular, for example, assume that you have an isotropic uh, system if you don't have an isotropic system, you can do power average. It's just a little bit more difficult when you have two diffusion wave vectors. And uh, at least I thought this, this was fun to work out for, <laughs> for, for that. So we, we came up with some scheme that has some nice properties. If you, are, if you are interested, you can look them up, but I don't want to spend time right here. You can do this power averaging. <clears throat> so uh, to validate that, we, we did this um, uh, biometric phantom by uh, Penny Hubbard from the Manchester group, Jeff Parks group. Um, it's co electrospun fibers. They are somewhat larger than the axons. I think they are around 10 micrometer in diameter. And they look at um, diffusion of uh, cyclohexane, which has a diffusion coefficient which is also lower than water. It's more than half that of water, so it's not too bad. But, but definitely, it's, it has some differences, of course, to, to water diffusion and axons. But what we did there, uh, was just to demonstrate that this basically works. So we have uh, three sets of, of, of power averaging designs. That's these, these three uh, groups here of, uh, yeah, three groups here. And then we have an FA, um, uh, SDE experiment. And we look at microscopic fractional anisotropy from the three power averaging designs and then FA. And we have three um, kind of systems here. One, one A is one fiber, single fiber, two, uh, B is, uh, Oh, sorry, AB is, is two crossing fibers and ABC is three crossing fibers. And what we see with FA is the point that I made before that if you have just one fiber, uh, you have some high value, relatively high, at least for this system of, uh, of FA. But then once you get uh, crossing fibers, it just goes down due to dispersion. Not because the fiber changes, it doesn't, but because of dispersion. On the other hand, for the micro FA, you see a very stable behavior for all three schemes here. So we also did uh, some experiments on a, a vervet monkey brain fixed uh, where we acquired uh, these metrics. So we got FA and we acquired this um, eccentricity metric. And one of the things we noticed was that it has these properties that we expected that, for example, so we see FA uh, has a very varying intensity inside white matter. <clears throat> Whereas uh, this eccentricity met, uh, metric or microscopic anisotropy is a better name actually, is more, um, is more homogeneous. And there are areas where these are 
uh, arrows point to, to regions in white matter for blue and gray matter for red, where FA drops, but um, microscopic diffusion anisotropy stays high. So this is the point I made before, and it's probably due to dispersing fibers, for example. So orientation dispersion, rather than what you might have thought, like axonal disintegration, or what do I mean? <clears throat> Yes, yes, yeah, you can also extract the dispersion from, uh, from the comparing these two exactly. We, I, we didn't do this for this study, but you can. <coughs> so just to demonstrate this um, property, here's a plot of microscopic fractional anisotropy and fra fractional anisotropy. And what you see is that all the points from these uh, six regions of interest that we have here, so listed here, uh, fall below the diagonal, more or less, meaning that uh, microscopic fractional anisotropy is always larger than fractional, fractional anisotropy exactly as, as we predicted. We see that, we saw in this experiment that um, it's actually larger in white matter than in gray matter, so opposite to what Norm Chemis saw. It's, it's a different, of course, it's a different species, but there are also experimental differences. So they had a pretty long diffusion time of 50 milliseconds. We had 15 milliseconds. And they had a different different Q vector, but this is only it's actually unexplored why there is this difference here. Uh, that's something we should look more into. Yeah. Yeah. So what they found, they found a larger eccentricity in gray matter, uh, or diffusion micros, uh, microscopic diffusion and a such in gray matter uh, than in white matter, and we find the other way around. So white matter is higher than gray matter, and I'm just I'm just listing. I I don't understand it. I'm just listing the, the reasons because I didn't dive into it. So the, re, the, the differences between the studies. So it's a different species, so pig versus monkey. Um, and it's a different uh, diffusion gradient strengths. And it's, uh, they have a much larger diffusion time of, uh, of, of 50 milliseconds. Uh, and we have, uh, I believe, uh, 15 milliseconds. So. I mean, there could be, so we are probing different length scales, right? So that could, that could be part of the information. Yeah, yeah, I mean, both were fixed, but there could be differences in the, yeah, for sure, yeah. true. So there's also a, a, a related nice example from Philip. I guess you all know Philip here. Uh, you might even have seen this graph where they look at, um, at, at two different types of tumors in patients and they note that the, Standard uh, ketosis kind of shows a similar behavior in these two very different tumor types. Um, and this just is a neat, I think, uh, illustration um, of how these types of, of extra metrics, so MKA is, is very similar to the microscopic diffusion and as such be epsilon that I talked about, or microscopic FA, and MKI is the isotropic var diffusion variance that I also talked about that I call VI. And they see, note here, that these two tumors behave exactly opposite for these two metrics. So I, I, I don't know about the clinical value of this. I'm told that these are not so difficult to distinguish clinically. But, but uh, nevertheless, I think that this is, is a very nice example that you, you actually have systems where something looks similar on conventional images, but very different on these new metrics. So, so just to prove that it does show something else. Yes. So they actually did biopsy of these patients, and they noted that this was exactly due to this difference between B and C. So in one kind of tumor, the one that has isotropic diffusion variance, so this one here, you have more at this kind of, of distribution of, of local environments, whereas in this one, you have more uh, the uh, anisotropy in orientations in environments. So this is what you see, and they have histology pictures in that paper. Do you remember which was the Oh, so so B is the glioma. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, this is the the paper by Philip from 2016. Yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty neat. No. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, these, the next two slides is just gonna, I'm just gonna, it's very preliminary work. It's done by, it's work in progress by Raphael um, Henrique. 
was with Noam Shemesh in, in Portugal. It was presented in, at the ISMM. And I just want to, sh to, to, uh, to show it to you to, to tell you that this can also be used to, to distinguish these ketosis, uh, all three ketosis sources. So the Q-space trajectory imaging, as I said before, basically assumes Gaussian diffusion or multiple Gaussian compartments. So there's no time dependence. So there's no, no restricted diffusion in it. Uh, in reality, you can, so, so they only have two contributions to ketosis, basically. They have this uh, K aniso anisotropic, uh, so the, uh, the epsilon. There's a lot of different notation here, sorry about that. And then they have the VI, so the variance in isotropic diffusivity. But there's also something that you get just because you have restricted uh, environments, right? That's also a non-Gaussian uh, Gaussian contribution. So you have three sources. And actually, it turns out that, uh, oh, here's an example, yeah. So this is normal Gaussian, you have no ketosis. Here you have um, the first term, this microscopic anisotropy. You get ketosis term, which, which mirrors this uh, anisotropy, as we've seen. Then you have the isotropic variance, as I also showed you, is also a, a, a ketosis term. But you also have restricted diffusion, like if you have a, a, a cylinder or a cell that restricts, that's kind of... Uh, impermeable to water molecules during your experiment, experiment time. So actually, it turns out that if you, if you, um, if you can estimate the whole of this C tensor with all its, its, 50, its 21 um, parameters, you could disentangle these three sources. So, so, so from a, um, images of the total ketosis, which includes everything, the normal ones we are used to looking at, you can, from the C tensor, split it up into an anisotropic part, an isotropic part, and an intra or restricted diffusion part. And yeah, like I said, this is very new, but there, here are some uh, observations that uh, Rafael made, that the um, anisotro anisotropic part is predominant in white matter. This is very intuitive. And the isotropic part is, is very uh, high and at the boundaries between the tissue and CSF. And the intra is also higher in white matter than gray, uh, gray matter. So the restricted part this had, could have to do with the relative permeability of, of myelinated axons versus non-myelinated uh, neurites. So um, I'm hoping also to get to some of the stuff that I did with Dimitri and Els in uh, um, New York, where I've spent the last year. Uh, but before that, just a, a short uh, story about the standard model. Um, so this is just this basic framework that very many groups are, are using in, diff in slightly different variations. So you have axons uh, or neurites in general, where you have um, an anisotropic Gaussian diffusion tensor, and you have the extra neurite space where you have uh, Gaussian diffusion. So basically a bi-exponential form if you have one coherent uh, nerve bond like this. Uh, so the assumption here is that you are insensitive to axonal radii. And this is very, very good approximation for normal diffusion gradient rings. I know when you get to the connectome, yeah, yeah, then you can start to see some of this stuff. But with, uh, with normal scanners, you, you cannot see it because you cannot attenuate over such a small distance. So it's very difficult to see. So they are approximated as sticks, basically zero radius, and the diffusion tends on the exosome space. Then you just sum over all fiber bundles with some orientation distribution. It's not so important for now. What is important for us is that, that this, this is an interesting model that many people would like to, to uh, estimate the parameters in clinical type scans. However, it turns out to be extremely difficult to estimate the parameters because it's basically an ill-posed problem um, in the sense that when you try to fit the landscape is very, very flat. Here's, a, here's an example where you have an, a fiber orientation distribution parameter and two kernel parameters, as we, as we call them, microstructure parameters, axonal diffusivity, axonal water fraction, and all of the parameters along this band here basically give rise to the same signal. So that means there's no way of, of you know, knowing what is actually the, how do you choose one? Um, unless you have some prior reason to, to, to believe that you know what one of the values are, for example. Um, so this is related to the fact that ketosis DKI is actually a really good approximation of clinical signals. Uh, so what do we do? We need some additional information. So we can go to higher B values, then we actually do resolve this. This is often not feasible. We can vary the diffusion time. Might, may, or may not be feasible. 
uh, we can vary the echo time. Uh, Yele Farad did something uh, with this where he also showed that that helped. Uh, but actually, you can do double diffusion encoding as well because it does give you new information. So here's an example. This is just uh, numerical simulations, but at ISMRM, um, we showed that this also holds uh, with experiments. So you get, uh, if you fit to, to this, this system, you get two solutions for all your parameters. Axonal water volume, uh, axonal water fraction, axonal diffusivity, and extra axonal diffusivity is fell in particular. And you see that you get two solutions in, in all the parameters. So you have no way of knowing you know, which one is the right one. But if you add a DDE to this experiment and fit to that, then suddenly you get rid of the, the spurious solution. So that's nice. So that's a way to, to, to uh, defeat this degeneracy. And right now, Santiago Coelho, uh, that, that was also from Santiago's uh, work, Santiago Coelho, who's at Leeds, PhD student. He's right now working on actually sampling this whole, um, this whole, this whole uh, world of bead tensor shapes to find out what, how, if you have some time available, what, how do you design your bead tensor shapes to, to best determine the parameters? And what he's finding is actually quite intriguing. This is also still not uh, completely done, but it looks to be quite robust actually. So two things, it seems that shells emerge automatically. So, so instead of you could imagine that you could just, these could have been all over the place, right? But they, they fall naturally on, on three shells, so three B values, fixed B values. And also, it turns out you don't need any spherical encoding. It, you don't get any. You just get uh, some proportion of linear on the lower shells, and then on the higher shell, you get linear and planar. So that's very intriguing. Okay, so a few minutes to the last part uh, with uh, Dimitri and Els. Uh, so what we are doing is that we're trying to kind of move this one step away from this geometry part. So in the, if we have, if we are honest, we know of course that that axons are not, not hollow cylinders, etc. Uh, so we need to add some more realism, perhaps, to get some more detail out. The only way I know of how to do that is to to describe um, the environment statistically. So now we 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 kind of imagine we have some system where we have a local diffusivity DFR. And this diffusivity is just the overall voxel average plus some delta D, which is just to match it to its actual value locally, the, some perturbation. It can actually be small or large, it doesn't have to be small. Because what happens here is that, that the diffusion, the diffusion process itself makes it, makes it small over time. Because diffusion is a smoothing process. So, so these, these kind of local, um, the effective diffusivity is an average over larger and larger regions. So the delta D is, is, is approaching zero automatically because time just evolves. Time, the evolution of time makes it a good approximation. Um, so now the, uh, the, the relevant um, descriptors of the system are the statistics of this, this random variable. So the, the, for the lowest one is the correlation function. So how, how closely related is the diffusivity at R zero to the diffusivity at R zero plus R. This is what uh, Dimitri and and Valerie did many years ago in, um, in NBM and Dimitri more recently in PNAS. And this, this work will, will build on what they uh, did back then. So as we know, non-Gaussianity, part of non-Gaussianity is kurtosis, but another part is time dependence. And what uh, Dimitri found was that, and co-workers found, was that the time dependent diffusivity is equal to its tortuosity value. So the long time limit, the infinity, and it approaches it with some power law, t to minus theta bar. And this theta bar is some number which characterizes our system. It's the, mini, it's, it's the minimum of one and theta, where theta is a, a universal exponent which characterizes our system. It's quantitatively given by the dimensions that particles are diffusing in, plus a number p, which is the number that characterizes our correlation function how the correlations decay, I'll, I'll give you an idea of what it means in just a minute. But if we look at this correlation function that I just told you about before, here it's just, it could be barriers that are kind of restricting diffusing. So that's the density of those barriers at, at the, the wave vector k. When we go to small k, that means long distances, it goes uh, to zero as k to, the, to some power p. That power is what enters here. 
and what defines the time-dependent behavior of diffusion and ketosis. So what does this mean? Let's just take a moment to explain that. So here are some uh, one-dimensional illustrations. So you have a line, particles are diffusion on a line. You have some barriers that are permeable. Uh, and the first one is a completely ordered system. It's periodic. The next one is a so-called hyper-uniform. So you take the ordered one, and then you look at each barrier independently and disturb it a little bit from its original position. So that means there's still some kind of memory of the original position, right? Whereas the Poissonian one is completely random. So there's no, no ghost of the underlying lattice there because there was no underlying lattice. And in this case, I won't talk about that. So, okay, to understand this thing here, the correlation function or the strength of the disorder, we can consider measuring the density of these barriers in some window, okay? And then we, uh, we look at how, how uh, different is this local density that we estimate from the global system-wide average. That is the delta N at this scale of the size of the box, right? Now, when I increase the size of the box, um, it's clear that my, my measurement will become more and more accurate. It will approach the global one. So that means that the fluctuations, so that the delta N will go to zero, right? The variance of the delta N will go to zero because I will, I will get closer and closer um, to, the, to the original, to the, to the system-wide limit. So going to zero means that, that uh, oh, sorry, going to larger and larger scales means having the wave vector going to, towards zero. So if we take the first system here, it's clear that as soon as I, lease, as I reach the lattice spacing, my local estimate of the density of barriers will be the same as the global one, right? So that means below some, some wave vector related to one over this distance, one over A, I will just have this correlation function be zero. So effectively, this exponent is, is in infinite P because it's faster than any power law. The hyper-uniform one, well, here it's clear that I need to, I need to go to a larger scale before I get an accurate before the fluctuations die out, right? Before I, I reach the average here. So in that case, uh, I get this green curve here. And for the, for the blue case here, it goes even smaller to zero. And the rate of this decay is actually encapsulated by this exponent P here. Now, when we now go to the diffusivity, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that the diffusivity only stops changing. So stops changing as a function of time once all molecules have sampled that representative part of the, of the system, right? So that is another way of putting this thing that, that the local density shouldn't change. So the, the more ordered the system is, the faster my, my spins have sampled that representative region. It's just less spacing. And here it's a bit further, uh, slower and so on. And we can see that here. This is the difference between the diffusivity and the tor tortuosity limit. And we see that the periodic one is the fastest, it's the exponential. Then we have a power law uh, with uh, minus three halves for the hyper-uniform and minus one half for the Poissonian. And for this is the other system here. So we see that it goes slower, the more disorder you have in your system. So that was a, a fast recap of, of uh, this P and A's, A's work. And you can try to work out what does this mean for the different types of geometries we can imagine in, in, in the brain. Well, if you have extra external space, um, you have uh, an effective uh, perpendicular to the fiber bundle. You have an effective dimension of two. If you imagine you have to total randomness in the placement of the axon, you have a p of zero. That means this theta is one. So in principle, you you would have thought that you would get this one over over t behavior. In fact, if you work it out in detail, you see that there's some correction. So it depends. Uh, it behaves as log t over t. But this falls out of this theory. And for the interaxonal space along the fibers, you, you have an effective dimension of one. Again, if you imagine you have some obstacles that are randomly distributed along the fiber, it could also be um, undulations or beats along the, the, the axon. You get an, an exponent of one half, so you predict that this time dependent is one over squared of time. And these have actually been, been confirmed by the NYU group with different um, experiments. And so, uh, the, what we what we have then been doing, or what I have been doing uh, during this year, is is to extend this to the DDE, and I, um, yeah, I apologize again for the for the math, but um, this is the re some of the results are framed in terms of uh, phrased in terms of these cumulants. So 
we uh, again we just expand the uh, double diffusion um, signal in powers of Q and powers of B, just as usual, right? Just the Taylor expansion. We have all possible types of combinations of Q1 and Q2. So we have like Q1 squared, Q1 to the fifth. We have uh, also cross terms like Q1 two is squared, Q, Q2 to the cube, et cetera, et cetera. So just an infinite sum here. And we just call whatever prefect that we have in front of all these sums, we call it C and M. And then it has some indices because it, because it has rank basically N plus M. And it depends on the two diffusion times and on the mixing time. So even though it, it may look a bit um, esoteric, uh, it's actually, just, it has a pretty simple uh, physical physical um, interpretation. It's just the correlation of, of the same number of R1s and R2s as correspond to these NNMs, right? So that means that as this C2 zero is just another name for the diffusion tensor basically of T1. And C02 is just another name for the diffusion tensor at time T2. <coughs> and similarly, four zero is the ketosis tensor Zero four also. It's only when we when we start having indices having uh, both of these superscripts non-zero that we get the new tensors. So C two two is R one squared R two squared basically. This is what I previously just called C. And um, then we have this C one three, which is one R one and three R twos, etc. Three one is three R one R ones and one R two. So so this one for example was all this what's this covariance tensor of diffusion, uh, local diffusion tensors. These ones, uh, I don't have any simple um, analogous uh, interpretation of those, but we can see what we can use them for in, in, in a minute. So here are our results. Uh, in the short time limit, short diffusion time limit, zero mixing time. Zero mixing time is the interesting limit here because if you only go to infinity, you just, uh, you just go to the product of two single diffusion encoding sequences. So, so diffusion time C22 becomes proportional to the variance of the local diffusivity. So this is, this is a normal interpretation of ketosis when you have multiple Gaussian compartment, right? And this is what, what you get if you just say that your signal is simply just a sum of a diffusion tensor distribution, then you would get this always, but in fact, you only get this in a general system for short diffusion times. So this shows you exactly when this uh, happens. And this, this is because for very short diffusion time, every, every spin just behaves as if it's in its own local uh, Gaussian box or something, right? So therefore the ketosis is as we know, the variance of diffusion var uh, diffusivities. For finite mixing times, yeah, th this generalizes, I won't have time for that. Um, this is for the C, uh, Oh, this looks like the, nothing happened. For C13, we get a similar behavior, except now it's, the, it's proportional to the, to the variance of the gradient of local diffusivity. So this actually gives you a, mess, a, a means to tell the difference between multiple Gaussian compartments and a more general scenario, because multiple Gaussian compartments, you have, you have uniform diffusivities. But here you actually get something which is proportional to the, to the spatial gradient of diffus, diffusivities. And this C13 uh, tensor actually has a cosine to the third behavior between the angles of the two diffusion wave vectors. So it can be identified uh, in that way, actually. Okay, so for the long time limit, we also find these power laws here uh, with the same exponent. But uh, the, the, the important difference now here is that this is actually not limited to, to a theta. Um, less than one. So if you remember, I had this theta bar, which was the minimum of one and theta. This means that once theta becomes above one, you cannot distinguish different theta values from each other because effectively they behave as if they were one. But you, so that's important for extra external space. But these ones behave different, up to three plus T halves. So in 1D it's two, right? So in 2D it's five halves. So, so here you have a, a better resolution. You can tell different systems apart by going to this, uh, these tensors here. I call this uh, screening. Okay, I just wanna mention that for periodic systems where you go above this limit, you get actually uh, that C13 is, is going towards a constant uh, and C22 also. Uh, 
because uh, yeah actually uh, and this i only have time to mention it we also solved uh, the whole thing for for an arbitrary diffusion sequence so no restrictions to small uh, diffusion wave widths just by by basically discretizing this and solving the equations and we still need to work out the implications of it uh, i just want to show you that you actually have some expression for this so you can use it kind of to again to optimize say you have a you, you you think you have some particular kind of system where you have some gamma then you can actually choose your way from q of t to up to get to get the optimal signal perturbation right to to magnify it as much as possible and we have recently generalized this to all orders of delta t so it's effectively we have solved this uh, this system exactly to um, yeah this random system for arbitrary diffusion sequences so we I, I know time is up so i just want to sh show you quickly that we did some simulations with a lot of turns out that there's a lot of noise in this in these properties uh, so you need a lot of particles so we had uh, 10 billion uh, which we ran on a, a graph and a CUDA simulation um, so here is the here is the uh, c22 for the poissonian system in one dimension this is the theoretical prediction not just the, not just the slope but also the actual numbers in front of it so there's no no fitting at all here it's just a comparison of two independent things so we see a very nice agreement here it's actually c c2 to divided by time squared because if you remember i had this t to two minus theta so i just want to get rid of the two and also have it go down to zero and not having it explode here the agreement is, is less good but uh, i think I believe it. It goes towards that line. It's, it's more noisy. Red just means that it's negative, and I just take the absolute value just to flip it back up to this. So it, it doesn't mean that it behaves strangely here. It just means that it goes down to s and come, becomes uh, sort of negative. Hyper-uniform. We predict three halves. Again, nice agreement with theory for C22, and also for C13. And um, the periodic system is, is actually the worst agreement. That has to do with the fact that kind of periodic is, it doesn't, um, there's no disorder. So there's actually no time to allow this perturbation theory to become a good approximation. Um, at least that's why we think that we have this, this, this offset here. The slope is, is pretty good, I think, but the, the constant in front is a little bit off. Okay, so um, yeah, in conclusion, I've shown you some different types of uh, information that DDE can, can give you and that it actually appears only at the ketosis level. And I've shown you that it can be used to distinguish different sources of ketosis and to resolve the standard model degeneracy to, to constrain the fitting basically. Um, I claimed that we solved effective medium theory to get the signal for arbitrary diffusion sequences and actually all orders and disorder. And I showed you the time dependence of cumulant tensors and which you can use to get time dependent microscopic diffusion and isotropy and time dependent isotropic diffusion variance. And we found this universal behavior with this power law exponent where you can also resolve larger than one exponent. And you can use this theory to optimize your waveform. Um, and you can use the theory also to, to detect by violations of this very common multiple Gaussian compartment assumption which by the way is the standard model is one example of. So yeah, and uh, that was basically it. So first I want to, I want to thank all my collaborators like this. He was here many years ago. Maybe some of, I know some of you know his name. Um, and uh, my home lab and, his, and uh, Dimitri and, uh, and Els of course for, uh, for hosting me during my year in NYU. And um, my students, Jonas, my collaborator, Noam, and Henrik and Tim, and Santiago, and uh, this is a group, and Anthony is a group member who helped out with the coding uh, from NYU, and same with Vigno, and uh, Mark is a student in Denmark as well. Um, yeah, uh, this one, I guess should have been the last one, so thank you for your attention.